morning, everyone, and welcome to class. Welcome to all our online students. Welcome to all our in-person students <clears throat> and our e-learning students who will be listening to this lecture later on. Uh, we'll begin with a word of prayer. So can one of our uh, online students lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Can any one of the online students lead us in prayer, please? Yeah, uh, you can hear me? Yes, thank you, Sam. Yeah, um, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for giving us this morning. We pray, Lord, as we enter class, that you would um, speak to us, Lord, through your word and your Holy Spirit, inspire our minds, our hearts. Um, thank you once again for this opportunity. Uh, we give it all to you in Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sam. So uh, last week, um, we began studying the book of Acts. Okay. And we looked at, we are looking at um, the early church where the revival broke out first, and which is a prototype for all other revivals. So all other revivals that we will be studying, we'll be studying it in the light of um, what happened on the day of Pentecost and thereafter, okay? So for that, we'll be studying the book of Acts. We'll be going through the book of Acts in quite a detail, okay? So for our study purpose, we have divided the book of Acts into three sections. The first eight years is highlighting the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on a small community that was very eager, earnest for um, the move of God, for... Um, uh, you know what Jesus had in store for them and that is why they were together praying and waiting on the Lord and uh, the next 10 years we see how this community the small community even though there was persecution or in, uh, even those who had come to Jerusalem who had witnessed the Pentecost when they went back after that 60 days of um, celebrating all the feasts everything in Jerusalem and they go back to their own cities their own um, uh, uh, towns, how they take this revival fire and how the revival fire spreads to other cities and other uh, countries as well. Okay, So we see from a small group of community how this uh, revival fire spreads and starts revival and uh, uh, sharing of the gospel and also establishing churches in many other cities and nations. And then we look the third section is the the last 20 years um which is basically we'll be studying apostle paul okay we'll see how one man okay carried this revival fire and all that we do um uh, all that we individuals can do to carry out the revival or take out the uh, revival or bring revival in other cities and nations okay so how we can be carriers of revival so we are basically looking at how a church how the revival began how this church community what did they do to experience that revival and also how that uh, uh, revival spread through the church community and then also not only the church, but also how individuals can, um, you know, um, uh, be used to be carriers of revival. So you're able to understand? Yes? Okay. So uh, that is on page, top of page number eight. Um, last week, we began looking at the first eight years, that is AD 30 to AD 38, a church in revival. And we are on top of page number nine so we are look we looked at uh, various features or various aspects of what happens when there is a revival or when revival breaks out okay so we are on top of page number nine now we see that there is a peace in the relationships that exist uh, within the church uh, do you think there was absolute peace there was no disputes no strife what do you all think were there dis disagreements? Were there disputes? Yes, there were, right? Yes, there were uh, disputes. There were disagreements. It's uh, A church is not a perfect church. A church is made of uh, human beings with their weaknesses. So there will be disagreements. There will be disputes that arose. But we look at the way it is dealt with. Okay, It is dealt in a very peaceful way. If you, look, if you read Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7, um, there was basically a dispute that aroused within the church. And we see how they um, responded to it. Okay, So they, uh, 
this shows us that there is uh, no that we can't say that there will be no disagreements there will be no problems when um, when revival breaks out there will be disagreements there will be problems there will be disputes but it is how we need to respond so we see that even though there was disputes and there was a disagreement the apostles brought about it uh, uh, brought the solutions in a very amicable in a very peaceful way okay now uh, some of you might be thinking why should we study the book of acts you know as a church we've already been studying it the last two months uh, you know um, uh, how how does this help in revival acts is just about the early church you know or it's just all about history so it's going to be boring so i want you to look at it in this way i want you to look at it in how you know to see how revive what revival does right what we need to birth revival as individuals also as a church community and what happens when a church community experiences revival so i want you to look at it in that aspect now that we are studying history for those of you who don't like history and geography you know can look at it in this way because we need a revival okay and how we need to respond to that and also if some of you are thinking uh, you know um, i want to birth a revival as individuals what you can do even as we look at paul's life okay so we see that even as there was a dispute um in during the time of revival there will be disputes but how the holy spirit gives the wisdom and enables the leaders or the apostles in the early church to uh, peacefully resolve and bring about solutions okay then um we see how their relationship was though with those outside the church okay um we see that the influence of the church was spreading this is something that we talked about right how when there's a revival the the influence of the church the gospel spreads uh, to the society to the community and to the areas beyond so revival doesn't just stay within the church it impacts the locality it impacts the society it impacts the community the state um, uh, the city the state and the nation and the nations okay so we see that the influence of um, uh the gospel was carried by people who were influenced themselves by the uh, gospel of jesus christ okay so people uh, we know had come to jerusalem from all other cities and nations that come to see what god was doing in the church and then we see that the the influence of um, uh, even leadership was spreading right the leaders were not just in um in um, in in jerusalem we see that they all we look at the maps later on we see how uh, philip we see how uh, peter uh, they go out and spread the gospel okay so we see that philip goes to samaria and when peter and john hear about uh, what god is doing and how the whole city of samaria is impacted they go also and they um, minister so we see that uh, even the leaders you know not just the apostles i'm not talking about the apostles i'm even talking about leaders like philip like other people we don't have the other names but we see so many else like uh, barnabas right so many of them who go out and they uh, share the gospel okay so what are we saying it's not only the main line leaders like the apostles who were going out and um, spreading the gospel but it was even the believers in the church who were taking this revival fire and they were Uh, going out and they were um, establishing churches and they were spreading the gospel okay so we see that even influence spreads to the uh, leadership okay uh, if you look at acts chapter 6 verse 7 everyone can turn your bibles to acts chapter 6 verse 7 and can somebody read that please acts chapter 6 verse 7 so the word of god spread so you have to use the mic please oh, yeah. yeah okay so the word of god spread the number of disciples in jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith amen so here we see that uh, not only common people were accepting the gospel but we see that uh, the priests who were actually opposing uh those who are believing jesus christ they also start to 
belief. So even people in the leadership, so even we can expect that when revival breaks out, that there will be people from you know other faiths, people from other religious beliefs who are leaders, even the governmental authorities, you know, they can come to faith. Okay. Then we see the word of God spread and um, you know how the disciples multiplied greatly and how it also spread among the priests. Okay. And we see like other leaders like uh, Saul, okay, uh, the Utopian eunuch, remember? Philip goes and meets him on the road to Gaza, okay, how he takes back uh, the gospel back to Ethiopia. And, um, you know, all of these people who are in, in position and in power, they were coming to faith in Christ, okay. And then we see how people or the believers in the early church responded to persecution, okay. They were not afraid of persecution. What did they do? With increased boldness and courage, they went out and they started spreading the faith. Even though there was persecution, you know, that is what will happen in revival. In revival, there will be persecution, but people will not be afraid. What they will do is they will go out with greater boldness, with greater courage. And even though there is opposition to the faith, they will continue in that uh, faith very strong and bold and confident and they will share the gospel okay and we also see among the early church there were great uh, signs miracles and wonders isn't that yes or no it was not only in the church at jerusalem we see that even in the surrounding uh, cities like philip goes to samaria and we see that believers are added to the church daily like we read in um in Acts, right? The believers were added to the church daily and they grew in number. So all of these things are some things that we uh, we can expect during revival. There is a greater exponential growth. People in leadership will come to the sun, to the faith. People uh, will take the gospel and share it in different places. And even though there is persecution, uh, you know, um, uh, people will go and share them faith okay so that is the first eight years um that we see um happening in um, in the book of acts okay then we look go on to uh, the next 10 years which is from acts chapter 8 to acts chapter 13 okay we'll see how uh, in verse chapters 8 to 13 how uh, this first community of uh, people who encountered the Holy Spirit, how that community takes that revival to other places, okay? So what is the next 10 years, what happens, or what, is, what ten, the next 10 years encompasses for us, how revival spreads throughout that community to other communities, okay? Now, um, the main um, reason why it spread, what one, is, one of the main reasons why it spread, one or two, okay, one is persecution, the other reason? Before persecution? Sorry, can you please use the mic? Okay, why did the uh, revival spread from that small community to various other communities or cities and nations? Oh. Because the people were, had come from very different region. Yes, people had come from different places all over to Jerusalem. Okay, so we see that uh, that was one of the reasons. And also there was persecution that arises. Okay, and all of them were scattered to different places. And wherever they go, they start churches wherever they go. Okay, so we see that, um, you know, um, what happened in Jerusalem uh, is the you know the same characteristics the same DNA that was in the church in Jerusalem is seen also in the new churches that um, started okay so people from all the places who had come to Jerusalem can you just show the map please uh, the first map uh, we look at uh, the first map where uh, we see how the people came all over the cities and countries they come to Jerusalem. Yeah, if you can see, um, you know, all of the cities that is mentioned uh, or the uh, nations that are mentioned in Acts chapter 
2 versus um, 9, 10, and 11. You can see that in the map. Yeah. Okay, so I, all of you who are not in the online students, you can also, it's not in your, uh, okay, maybe it's there. But if you look here, you know, how it moves to, you know, as far as uh, Arabia and far as uh, Rome, and we also see, um, wait, let me pull up my um, maps, yeah. So we see uh, it goes all the way to Mesopotamia, you know, and then to um, uh, all of those Asia's uh, regions in Syria, uh, Egypt, uh, Libya, that is Africa, and then it goes all the way up to Rome, okay? So all of those, uh, so many cities and so many nations, um, the, the island of Crete, all of those uh, places, the gospel is spread. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. And look at how God in the opportune time, the right moment when everybody came. So, you know, uh, they take back the gospel to as far as Egypt, Libya, you know, and uh, Rome. So we see that um, uh, all the way to the other side of the Mediterranean Sea where Rome is, you know, all of these different parts of uh, Asia as well, uh, and also Africa, the, um, um, the gospel is taken. Now, if it did not happen on the day of Pentecost, it had happened some other time, the progress would have been a little more slower, okay? But we see uh, such a vast, um, uh, uh, you know, area of uh, places that were covered up just because of what people experienced on that day of Pentecost, okay? So we look at uh, some of the main things that happen in these next 10 years. Uh, we see that first in Acts chapter 9, uh, where, that is in AD 38 to 47. So the start of those first 10 years is when Saul comes to faith. Okay, So Saul encounters um, uh, Jesus on the road to Damascus. We know that Saul was somebody who was persecuting the Christians. But then, you know, uh, God just works in his life and takes a U-turn and he starts to follow Jesus, okay? And also during this 10 years, we see um, uh, Philip, okay, uh, who's not an apostle, just a disciple. So if you look at your map as well, um, there, uh, Philip, okay? Um, so we see, um, yeah, Philip, um, you know, um, on the day of when the persecution broke out in Jerusalem, we see all the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea. So if you look at the number two there, it's Judea. And also Samaria, which is uh, number three, okay? And um, we see that when Stephen was uh, buried, after that, uh, you know, Paul continues to harass the church. And, uh, you know, we see that Philip goes all the way to the city of Samaria, okay? That is uh, number four, okay? He goes to... Um, Samaria, and he preaches the gospel uh, there, and um, uh, Peter and John, uh, John, jo John join him there, you know, uh, before returning to uh, Jerusalem. And then we see that, uh, you know, God tells, or the angel of God tells uh, uh, Philip to go down to the road to Gaza. So that is five. So from Samaria, he travels to Gaza. All of you who are in-person students, you can log into the online class, and if you want, you can look at um, the, the map there. So he travels all the way from Samaria to the, the road to Gaza. It's there, point number five, if you look at your map, okay? Um, and then, you know, um, uh, that's where he meets the Ethiopian eunuch. And then you, you know that, you know, the Spirit of God just suddenly takes... Uh, Philip away and he's found in Azitis, which is uh, point six, if you see there. And then he goes all the way to um, uh, Caesarea. Okay. And as he's going, traveling from Azitis to Caesarea, you know, um, we see that um, he's sharing the gospel and uh, he meets, uh, you know, 25 years later during the visit by Paul, he meets Paul, 
uh, here. Okay, so we see how uh, even Philip, who was not even an apostle, just a believer who was serving in the church, you see the powerful work that he was uh, doing. Okay, um, yeah, so. Then we look at uh, Peter as well, the Apostle Peter, um, his uh, travel, what he does after the persecution breaks out. So we see that uh, the whole church throughout Judea, that is number one in G Galilee, you can see is uh, number two there, okay, the whole of Galilee and Samaria, they basically enjoyed peace. Um, but then uh, we see that after the persecution arose, uh, people moved out. But before that, you know, Peter, uh, he traveled from Jerusalem and came all the way to Lydda. Okay, that is five. Okay, and where we see that he finds a bedridden man who is bedridden for eight years. And um, uh, Peter said to Aeneas, you know, get up. Uh, take your mat or take your bed, and he is e healed. So that is what happens there in Lydia. And um, um, we see that there was, uh, he goes from Lydda to Joppa, which is uh, six on your map. And there we see that uh, um, he heals a woman there. And then um, uh, we know that, you know, Peter travels all the way from Joppa to Caesarea, which is 0.7. And what happens in Caesarea, very significant. What happens to Peter when he's in Caesarea? What happens when uh, Peter is in Caesarea? Very important chapter. Chapter 10, Acts chapter 10. What happens? Huh? Cornelius sees her in a dream. What happens? Yes, he was a devout man. He feared God. And uh, we see that um, um, he sees in a vision the angel of God coming and telling him, to send men to go and get a man called uh, Peter, right? So Cornelius sends uh, uh, his servants or his men to get Peter, okay? And who's Cornelius, Jew or Gentile? A Gentile, yes. So uh, before these men comes, what happens to Peter? Yeah, he's very, very hungry, right? And he goes on the terrace, okay? And he's waiting for food to be prepared. And what happens? He sees a trance, okay? And what, what does he see in the trance? I know all of you don't read the Bible. <laughs> huh? You're not reading the Bible? He falls into a trance. Yes, Andrew, thank you. And what happens? So he sees a big sheet of, uh, you know, a big cloth or a big sheet and all clean animals, right? Yes? No, he sees all unclean animals. And then what does God tell him to do? Get up, Peter, get up and kill and eat. And he says, I can't eat it because it's all unclean. And what does God say? What God has created, don't call us. Unclean, and he says, Two men are waiting for you, go with them. It's good to read the book of Acts. Okay, all of you, it's very interesting stories uh, or narratives that happen in the early church. Okay, and so uh, we see that Paul goes with these men, and it's actually to the whole house of Cornelius, who is a Gentile. So is, Phil is Peter very excited and happy? Huh? Yes, no? No, why? Why, Nelson? Take the mic and speak. Because he's a Gentile, and Gentile, often they do have some means uh, worldly things like drinking, eating, they might have. So. Okay. The Jews and Gentiles don't associate with each other, especially the Jews don't uh, associate with the Gentiles. And the Jews used to think that for 
theirs is the law, the covenants, the there's the forefathers, you know, theirs is uh, the sign of the covenant that is circumcision. Everything is given to them and not the Gentiles. Now, when Peter has to go and preach to the Gentiles, he's shocked. And that's when he realizes. And then Cornelius tells him, you know, what he sees in his dream. That's when he realizes hey, the, the uh, gospel is not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. And even before Peter gives altar call, what does what happens? Holy Spirit comes, ma'am, on the Cornelius family. Yes, the Holy Spirit comes upon uh, them. We see before that they are cut in their heart. That means they uh, repent of their sins. Peter doesn't give an altar call. Before that itself, the Holy Spirit works in their lives. And then what happens? They are baptized in the Holy Spirit. How does Peter know they are baptized in the Holy Spirit? Yeah. So, Asapu, tell me. Yeah, they start speaking in tongues, right? Uh, no, there's no tongues of fire. The tongues of fire only on the day of Pentecost. But here they start speaking in tongues and then Peter is shocked. Okay? And the disciples are wrong with the Peter are also shocked what happened, what is happening here. And then they realize um, Peter realizes the the trance that he had, what God was trying to communicate, and he realized that the gospel is also for the Gentiles. Okay, so that is uh, Peter's uh, journey there. So uh, till you know, so he goes from uh, Jerusalem, he goes to uh, Lydda, to Joppa, and to uh, Caesarea, and then comes back, uh, and also goes to Samaria. Um, First Jerusalem, then uh, Samaria, then comes to Jerusalem, then Lydda and Joppa, Caesarea, and back to Jerusalem. Okay, so that is um, Paul uh, Peter's journey. Okay, so we see that um, you know uh, the gospel is taken by Peter right up to Caesarea, and also now the gospel has been uh, received to the by the. Gentiles. Okay, so the Jews are now aware that the gospel is also for the Gentiles. So we see what happens in revival, right? God initiates new moves, new things that happen, and we need to just be available to his move and what he is doing. And even as he takes us along, we just need to be willing. Okay, so now we look at um, um, Paul's um, journey. Okay, so we see that, uh, you know, Paul is going from, yeah, you can make that big, please. Yeah, Paul goes from, um, takes letters from Jerusalem uh, to persecute the Christians where? Paul taking letters to persecute the Jews in which place? From Jerusalem to, he travels to which place? Damascus, Damascus. yes. Yes, and then uh, he encounters Jesus. Okay, so then from the uh, he goes into the city of Damascus, and then from Damascus you see he goes all the way down to Arabia. Okay, if you look at right down on your uh, the map, the 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 right hand corner uh, of the screen is Arabia. That is number four. So he goes right down to Arab Arabia, and then. Um, from Arabia, you know, he um, goes back to Damascus, okay? And there in Damascus, he's, um, you know, um, people want to kill him. People want to uh, take his life. So he plans and he goes all the way back, uh, goes all the, play, uh, all the way to Jerusalem, okay? So that is um, what Paul does in the early um, stages. And then he goes back from Jerusalem because, uh, you know, there's a lot of persecution that happens. He's in Jerusalem, but he's preaching in the uh, synagogues and he's, um, <clears throat> you know, he's uh, sharing the gospel and um, uh, the Jews want to kill him. And so we see that the disciples hear of this plan that the Jews want to kill uh, Paul, so they escort him all the way from Jerusalem to Caesarea. Can you see Caesarea there? Yeah, point seven. Okay, and then from Caesarea, 
um, we see that you know before he uh, uh, Caesarea he goes to Lydda. Lydda is not there, but then from Caesarea he goes all the way to Tarsus. So if you look right up on your screen, uh, on the right hand side of the Mediterranean Sea, point nine is uh, Tarsus. Uh, where Paul is basically from, so he goes back to his hometown, uh, that is Tarsus. Okay, and uh, we see that during this time, okay, uh, like Peter and Philip and Paul and all the other disciples are traveling. So we see that churches are established in Lydda and uh, Joppa. Okay, and the churches at Lydda and Joppa uh, just mm -hmm. grew. Okay, and the, the churches they were thriving. So another uh, aspect of revival is we see that many churches will be planted as a result of revival, and also the churches there will grow uh, fast, and also the the churches will be thriving. What's the meaning of thriving? Yeah, push forward, uh, flourishing, being very successful you know, prosperous, just growing in the things of God and just moving, okay? Okay. So we see that um, uh, even in the church at Antioch, there you can see on your map on the right-hand corner, uh, number 10 is Antioch, okay? We see that um, church was also started there in Antioch, okay? Uh, and this is Antioch in Syria. Now, there are two Anti Antiochs, one Antioch in Syria and one Antioch in Pisidia, okay? But um, Antioch in Syria is where Paul starts all his missionary journeys and he comes back to uh, Antioch in Syria. That is on your map. Uh, on, uh, on the to right-hand top is number 10, where is Antioch of Syria, okay? So... Um, the church was started there, and within three or four years in this church at Antioch, we see that there were leaders and prophets and teachers who were raised. So we see another aspect of revival is that, you know, when churches are started in different places, it's not just churches just stand, you know, just started for a time being, but churches that grow exponentially, which thrive very well, and also the leadership is being built up. So here we see that these churches in Lydda, Joppa, and in, um, in Antioch, they were not depending on their mother church. Which is a mother church? Which is a mother church? Jerusalem. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lucy, and thank you, um, Gertrude. It's the church at Jerusalem. That's the main mother church, right? From there where all the believers who were dispersed, there from there were all the apostles, the disciples who went out and who started uh, churches. Okay. So we see that um, within three or four years here, this church was not dependent on the main church. The church grew so well that they established or they had leaders, they had prophets, and they had teachers. So remember when we were studying um, um, the ministry of an apostle, prophet, and a pastor and a teacher? We studied this, right? F he gave some first to be apostles, then prophets, then teachers. And how do we get this? This is from the church at Antioch. Okay, which we read in Acts chapter 13, um, verse 1. So everyone can please turn to Acts chapter 13. I hope all of you are with me and are not getting bored. Okay, Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Thank you, Daniel. Can somebody read Acts chapter 13, verse 1, please? In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, Colnagar, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian and Saul. Yes. So here we see something very important. Okay. Even though there was this new church that had been planted, you know, it was of course started by the mother church in Jerusalem. Maybe some of the apostles, the local leaders or the believers from the church at uh, Jerusalem, they went and they spread this revival fire. And we see how 
The other places experience revival. Okay. So some things that we can learn from here is the first thing is, you know, uh, to raise when when you raise up a church. Uh, some of you are interested in church planting. Some of you are interested in being missionaries or evangelists. You're going and you know, um, uh, uh, preaching the gospel and you want to establish a church or you want to be an apostle, God has called you to be there, that you can learn some things from here. The first thing that we can learn is to raise um, believers who are strong in the word and spirit. Okay, so when these believers in the church are strong in the word and spirit, they can take the revival or they can take the gospel uh, and raise up many new churches okay so we need it's important that a church raises up local leaders who will be able to do the work of the ministry um if you are not raising up believers within the local church to be le in the leadership position who are strong in word and in spirit then it's impossible to spread the gospel okay because the leadership like the main leaders the pastors they're called for that specific church right they're shepherds over that church but as a shepherd some of you are already pastors in your churches this is what you need to do you know don't think some of sometimes we think i me myself okay this is my kingdom my world my church no one should come up as leaders no that is wrong that is not what we see in the bible that is not is what we see in the early church but in the early church what we see the pastor the leaders there the apostles there you know trained up and raised up strong believers we see in acts read in acts chapter 2 that those who had come from all over jerusalem when they had come they just listened to peter's sermon yes three thousand were uh, 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 had received the gospel when peter healed a lame man four thousand but these were not just okay we accepted jesus christ hallelujah praise the lord we're going to heaven and didn't go back happily to their hometown or country they spent the rest of the time just listening to the apostles just being taught of the doctrines that's what we read in um in Acts chapter 2, right? And then they go back and start churches. So even when Paul is writing to the church at Rome, you know, Paul did not start the church at Rome. We don't know who started the church at Rome. So the uh, scholars say that, you know, the church at Rome would have started by believers, you know, who had uh, an experience on the day of Pentecost. And we saw the first map. Can you please put the first map again? The first one. Yeah. You see, right from jerusalem all the uh, countries and the nations right across the mediterranean sea to rome that's how far the gospel had spread okay and also to africa and right up to rome so all of these places okay uh, we see that the gospel was taken and these people who went were strong in word and in the spirit because the disciples or the apostles had built them up and strengthened them in the faith and so that is what we need to do as pastors so those of you who are called to be pastors don't think this is my kingdom and this kingdom dies with me no this kingdom is an everlasting kingdom it doesn't die with you you have to raise up leaders don't be threatened by others who come into leadership if you're doing that that means you are not actually um, in the leader in the full sense of who God wants you to be. A leader is not threatened by his position. Even if somebody pulls you down from that position, the serving God, he will take you elsewhere and use you. Okay. So what we need to do is raise up leadership within the church, raise up a strong leadership in the church who can go out and then start new churches, who can then go out and plant churches and replicate what you have started in your church so role of a pastor is so important sometimes we think the role of a past apostle and a um, prophet is much greater than a pastor but you see the role of a pastor here is so great right the role of a pastor is not only to shepherd his flock not only to feed them not only to take care of them but also to raise up the next leadership who will and then send them out sometimes we don't want to send people out we want to them to be in our church and so we say you know 
oh, that's not God's calling. God is not calling you as a missionary. He wants you to do this. He wants you to do that. Because you think that, oh, if he leaves, and who's going to take part of that, take care of that department? Well, it's God's work. If one goes, God will bring the other. If God is sending somebody else to birth revivals to uh, move and to plant other churches, you know, train them so that they can go and replicate what God has uh, is doing here in this church. And as a pastor and as an apostle, your assignment is here. So you be here and take care. So that is what is the first thing that we learn. In some ministries, uh, usually uh, the uh, fathers would have started the uh, ministry and the church and the church grows, ministry goes, and then it is their children, then it is their grandchildren. So in those scenarios, it is subject to how God leads or it's also like for us not to judge uh, a thing. Why are there not other people in the leadership position in the church or how, because the ministry keeps growing, but somewhere back of the mind. Uh, yeah, so you said it, right? Um, how do we know it's the, the we don't judge them how do we know it's the work of the lord you said the ministry keeps growing so anything that we see is the work of god we need to look at the how do you know the tree the fruit you look at the fruit what is happening you know and even if there's no fruit is we are no one to judge right we just uh, if if you're not happy there your god is moving you elsewhere you move you no one to judge but you can still pray for that pastor and that uh, the leader yeah uh, what we're saying is okay if there's a transition of leadership happening with generations within the family um, it's it's okay um, but what we're saying is that the pastor should train up leaders and they should in turn go I uh, send them out church should always be sending out people church is not a place where we are just eating and being yes fattened calves. God doesn't want fattened calves because there's no more sacrifices that he has to be made. Okay, he wants people to be sent out because we're sent out, right? The Great Commission itself is go, preach and teach and baptize in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Okay, the second one is to believe God and move with him. So expect God to open doors. Okay, don't say, okay, the revival is happening here. We enjoy the revival, uh, you know, go on with life and um, we want to see that, uh, you know, enjoy this revival and just go on with our lives. No, what do we need to do? We need to see the revival spread. Okay, all of you, we are on page number 11. Those of you who are falling asleep, um, you can go to page number 11. If you're falling asleep, you can start reading page number 11. I can see people yawning. Eyes is uh, uh, minds are wandering. So please look at page number 11. If my uh, lecture is monotonous and boring, please read from the text. At least that will speak to you. Okay. So it's not that we just enjoy revival wherever, wherever we are. Okay. But we need to trust God to move. That is a characteristic of revival. Be willing to move out and take it to other people. The third thing is what was the third thing? Oh, sorry, when, yeah. Yeah, what is the third thing? The third thing is when we face persecution, just trust God. Okay, trust God to use us as an opportunity to share the gospel in new places. Uh, that means we are leaving our comfort zones. We're leaving places that we are comfortable with. Um, <laughs> Oh, Abhishek. Abhishek is saying it's a good thing you can't see the online students, Pastor. That means you're snoring, Abhishek. Okay. Just joking. Okay. So, um, third is like when we face persecution, just trust God okay, to use us as an opportunity to take the gospel to new places. Okay. Uh, it means leaving the places that we are going, where we are and going to new places or to continue uh, in Jerusalem like the some believers and some apostles did. They, they continued in prayer. They trusted God to protect them. And also we see how God uh, worked even during persecution. What are some of the things we see happening during persecution? From the book of Acts. If you're listening to Pastor's sermon also, all of you in-person students. What are some of the things that happens during persecution? Even when the church is persecuted, what happens? 
this okay we're preaching with boldness and courage what else what do the people do with the apostles and uh, and with peter and john Okay, they prayed, but what did they do to the apostles and Peter and John? Okay, they stoned Stephen to death. Thank you, Lucy. Yes. They put them in jail. Yes. They put them in jail. Okay, and what happens when they're in jail? The angels comes and visits them and delivers them. So that is what we looked at, right? Page number nine, right on top of page number nine. One of the characteristics of the first eight years of revival, angelic visitations. Okay, uh, we see how the believers were praying for the those who are in prison, Peter and John, and how the angel comes and delivers them out of uh, prison. Okay, um, and we see how God protects them. Also, we see how God dealt with King Herod, who was bringing about the persecution. We see how God deals with him. He dies, right? So, in this period of ten years. Also, we see, you know, how God um, delivers His people and how He spreads the gospel in in spite of the persecution. Okay, who's ringing the bell? Nikhil. Okay. Okay. So we'll stop here and we'll come back after the break and continue. Thank you. <laughs>